Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the Belmont Saga, part one of Against the Juries, chapter three, three letters. And this is another lantern chapter. I always like those. When the lantern is around, anything is possible. Last week, our three intrepid heroes are trying to make themselves at home on the Seeker as best they can. It's not easy, but they're getting the bridge set up so that they really don't have to go anywhere else on the ship, because everywhere else is just foul with voices and cajoling ill will and bad feelings. They uncover the hidden potty and in case that didn't make sense in the days of the seeker when the seeker was designed lord milo saprobert who was the designer of the ship was a close personal friend of captain davidge and captain davidge said hey can you put in a hidden bathroom basically so that i can disappear into it when i need to and re-emerge re it's not going to appear on any blueprints or anything this is just a personal favor to me and lord milo said sure i will install a secret bathroom and the admiralty didn't know it was there so when they pulled out all the other commodes potty trenches and heads in the ship they missed that one and paymaster stenstrom remembered lieutenant kylos telling him about that when they were aboard the seeker that how she will she would like to go in there on occasion and have a nice long dump where nobody bugging her they go they find it they get it they try to hook it up and then tara who's using her mollied up smarts to engineer shipboard plumbing which is not easy to do says there's something stuck in it she goes down and looks and sure enough there's what she sees she thinks she sees a lady in the pipes looking up back at her she remembers the blue eyes and blonde hair and that the lady seemed really really pissed and aram goes in with one of paymaster stenstrom's ints doesn't see a lady but he sees like something stuck in the pipes and it's got like a long gold chain and he pulls it out and sure enough it's this funky lantern and stenstrom remembers it being the lantern that lily was carrying a lantern that seemed to have vast arcane abilities and sure enough, it is the the paramel of old, the the great white streak, the the lantern of saga. Well, any number of places it's been throughout antiquity, and here it is in the pipes of the seeker. And they find when they put it on the missives panel, it imparts a great deal of power to the ship. The ship is basically at full power, even though it doesn't have engines, but all the other subsystems light right up like a sky full of fireworks and tara started uh, trying to reprogram the missive panel so that they can make use of this power paymaster stenstrom who hasn't really had a good cleansing sleep since they've been aboard passes out and that's where the chapter ended of course the last time he passed out when he woke up all hell broke loose so we'll see what happens this time and this i'm not sure how long this chapter is if we get through it fast enough, we can go on to the next chapter, chapter four, which is known as A Curse. Woo! So let's proceed immediately. Part one, chapter three, three letters. Bell! Bell, wake up! Stenstrom opened his eyes. Tara was leaning over him, her sideburns tickling his chin. Oh, did I sleep? He asked, rather groggy. He sat up and rubbed his eyes. B Belle, I, I need to show you something, she said. Still in her socks, Tara led him over to the missive's panel. Before he'd nodded off, the panel had been a confusion of random lights and strobe-like flashes lighting up the bridge, like a gaudy dance hall. Now it was tamed and orderly, lighting up with calculated precision with Lily's lantern sitting innocently in the center, giving life to it all. Did you get the system under control? 
he asked. I sure did. I had to remaster it from scratch and get it away from the comm panel, but I did it. Oh, great work, Tara. You deserve an E degree in engineering. Well, thanks. I managed to get the lights working on key decks on the ship. Oh, not many, but we can turn them on and off from here. I also got the cameras in the ship's archive going. Well, that's, that's great news. Well done. But Tara wasn't happy. I was uh, going over the ship's old records. They're still in the archives. And they go back a pretty long <gasps> way. Look here! Tara manipulated the controls. On the screen, many people appeared, mostly crewmen, all apparently vacating the ship. Many dragging luggage and other assorted personal items with them. What we're seeing is the final service day of the previous crew a couple months back. This is Deck 6, Central Section. Everybody's heading to the Ripcar Bays to fly on down to the surface. The captain had given up his chair, the engine and the bosun were, were gone by this point, and the ship's priory was closed. The crew was vacating in favor of other vessels. Look at all the hugs and thumps on the chest. Tara pointed at the screen. Look! Look there! You see that? On the screen, mixed into the throng of departing people, was a blonde-headed woman, a civilian wearing a festive pink gown, carrying a small handbag. Stenstrom was astonished. I I is that Lily? Well, looks like her to me, and I got a nice long gander at her in the plumbing. The image of Lily waded through the passing crewmen until the crowd thinned out to a trickle. Finally, as they watched, Lily was alone in the now deserted corridor. She reached into her bag and pulled out a tiny white envelope, which she placed on the floor in the center of the corridor. She looked up at the camera for a moment, smiled, and slowly walked away. Look at that! What's she doing? Tara asked. Well, this seems to be an envelope of some sort. Yes, of course! Remember when we first came aboard, we found that odd letter lying in the central corridor? Tara rolled her eyes up, thinking back. Uh, seems like a long time ago. Uh, uh, right, right, right. I remember it. It was sitting on the floor in the central section of the ship just after we boarded. Wait, wasn't it addressed to me? Well, that's what you thought, and Aram thought it was addressed to him. We had a lot of work to get done, so I put it in my little case here to prevent it from distracting us. I had assumed we were a little... Oxygen deprived due to our upload and we're seeing things. And your lady Lily left it there for us? Why? Well, one way to find out. Stenstrom waved his hands and produced the case. He opened it. Inside was an innocuous white envelope laying face down. He picked it out and tossed the case aside. He held the envelope and flipped it around, reading the header to himself. He held it out and showed it to Tara. What's this say? he asked. She squinted and looked at it. Well, it's made out to me. It says, Private Tara De La Anderson, 110 Marines. Pretty handwriting. So you're certain that's what it says? Yeah, Belle, I'm from Baz, but I can still read LC, you know. She puzzled at the envelope and fiddled with the golden charm of a fish hanging at her neck. The Molly's not telling me much. This thing's actually giving me the creeps. Stenstrom produced several holy stones, a prism and a polyhedron. What are you doing? Tara asked. I'm checking the envelope for the arcane. This holy stone here shall determine if it's actually a letter or some sort of arcane object disguised as a letter. Is that possible? Tara asked, fascinated. Well, anything's possible. He moved the holy stone along the face of the letter. The holy stone did nothing as it touched the surface of the paper. Well, the letter is not astral. What's that? Tara asked. The astral plane is sort of a, a pocket dimension that's all around us. The Zaffins sometimes make use of it to travel 
great distances very quickly, though it's a dangerous proposition. The thing about the astral plane is that it plays havoc on your perceptions. You can't trust any of your senses. You say the envelope is addressed to you, but when I look at it, I see it as being addressed to me. And if Aram were to look at it, I'm certain he'd see it as being addressed to him. That's what the astral plane does. Were you expecting such a thing? I had a notion. When we arrived on the ship, the bridge was contaminated with the astral plane. It was? Tara asked. You didn't say anything. Well, I didn't want to alarm you, and while incursions of the astral plane can be intentionally created, they can also happen on their own and are more common than you might realize. He remembered back. The bridge studded with steel jaw traps waiting to bite. So you were hoping the astral plane just happened to be here on the bridge all by itself and not put here by somebody on purpose? Why, well, uh, suppose so, yes. Well, you're more of an optimist than I would have been. How do you get rid of it? Tara asked. How? Blue holy stones. They're full of certain metals and solutions that block out the astral plane. They're fairly effective at short range, and I use them to clear the bridge. I have a few more here. So I think this is probably the safest place to trigger the letter and deal with whatever happens afterwards. Then it'll be done. He waved his hand and produced an olive holy stone. He rolled it across the face of the envelope. It rattled with a fuss. Arcane. This letter detects as arcane. The same holy stone detected Lily as being arcane as well. She had quietly sat and allowed him to roll the holy stone down the length of her arm, rattling the whole time. Why, Belle? Of course I'm of the arcane. Well, I guess that's bad, Tara said as she pulled on her boots and wiggled into her coat. What do we do? Stenstrom put the holy stone back into his coat. We opened the letter and face whatever is inside. He shook Aram, who was still sound asleep at the navigator's position. Aram, wake up. He muttered and opened his eyes. Uh, what? Uh, what is it? We're opening that creepy letter we found the other day. It's all hexed out. Bell's lady left it for us. Uh, so why in the name of creation are we opening it? We're going to discover its intent and be done with it. Tara, go ahead and open it. Without fear or trepidation, Tara seized the letter and tore it open. Well, so far so good, she cheerfully said. She pulled out three slips of scented paper. Looks like a couple pieces of paper to me. Tara laid them out on the panel. Now what? While Aram held a few steps back, Stenstrom examined the slips. Continuing his bizarre examination, he rolled his holy stones over the top of the paper, taking note of the results. He ran his finger across one of the slips. I'm uh, looking for grit, for minute sense, and hidden writing on the paper. All of these things can be significant. Tara sniffed the slips. Smells like nice flowers to me. Lavender. It's Lily's favorite scent. And lavender can be an ingredient in arcane tinctures. Perhaps that should have been a clue that your love wasn't all she seemed, Aram said, disconcerted by all of this. There shall be nothing odd about my love, uh, whoever she might be. Are you finding anything? No, he stated flatly. I'm not. The paper reads as arcane, but the slips within seem to be just that, paper. Well, th that's a relief. Tara leaned in. It looks like there's one for each of us here. Here's one for me. And the middle one is yours, Aram. And that one on the right is yours, Belle. How can there be one for you and me, Tara? We just met Belle a few days ago, and neither of us know Lady Lily from Lacerda. Who's Lacerda? Tara asked. Oh, n never mind. Just probably some crazy Canaan lady. Well... Rami, I don't know. Apparently Lily isn't quite right. Is she? She was all nice and snug up in our plumbing not long ago. She turned to Stenstrom. Belle, what the heck is Lily? Is she a demon? 
The word demon can be applied to most any creature or entity not of a standard classification. So in that reckoning, yes, I suppose she is a demon. As to the exact nature of her arcane status, I have no idea. She was about to tell me and got summoned by her masters, whomever they are, before she could finish. I'll say she had me and my mother completely fooled all these years. Mother thought and I did as well, that Lily was a highly talented, intelligent, but otherwise mundane woman from Gamboa. She even revealed to me that she's not- God damn it! Stop barking, puppy! Take two. She even revealed to me- Gosh darn it, puppy, stop barking! She even revealed to me that she's not from Gamboa, so all the things I thought I knew about her were incorrect. In any case, she walked the plains between our little ship here and Cana and was powerful enough to kill literally dozens of soul devourers all by herself without so much as breaking a sweat. Dang, Tara exclaimed. Now that's a girlfriend. You should suit her up and put her in the arena or something. The most I've ever done is fight two corporals, a slut, and an MP in a bar once. Stenstrom picked up the paper made out to him. Read it, Belle. Oh, uh, even the mushy stuff, I actually sort of like that, Tara chirped as she settled down to listen. He cleared his throat and read. It says, To my dearest Stenstrom, As it is no doubt obvious at this point, I have not been entirely honest with you these past years, about myself and other things as well. For various reasons, I have been compelled to lie to you, to not be forthright as to my true nature and purpose, though it pained me to have to do so. I have dreamt of the moment when I can reveal all to you, to allow you to see me as I truly am. I am certain you have many questions, however, all I can do at this time is to state that my love for you has never been greater or more complete. Please know that as you read this note, I am taking steps to ensure we are never parted again. I've watched you for most of your life from afar and long before our quote-unquote introduction a few years ago. I've protected you as well and I will inform you that your ship was heavily contaminated with the astral plane purposely placed here by parties unfriendly to you. I have cleaned out the ship as best I can, though pockets of astral material might remain, and I do bad you be careful. I have sought to locate these parties and deal with them. However, they have eluded me to this point. Once matters at hand have been squared away, you may rest assured that I shall discover and dispense with them. They all looked at each other, and Stenstrom continued. And now I see you sailing alone into peril. Given my current situation, I might not be able to help you directly. Therefore, I have left you the paramel, an elder device that illuminates many things. It has agreed to help you, and I have secured it at great risk to myself. I beg you use it well. I have determined that on your present course, and given the diminished condition of your ship, you shall soon sail into great danger. The old mariner tales that abound in this lonely region of space, the whispered stories of the, the devil and missing people and a bad dream seem at least in part to be true. And I have seen your death in a dark place hidden from sight. I do not have time to fully explain myself. I will say only to beware Drury's belt and most importantly the leeward side of it. I have plotted you a safe course through the deep sea where you will not be detected. Please trust in me and follow Paramel's beam and soon you shall be safe. I, I promise. Please allow your companions to read their notes and when they are finished, place this paper into Paramel's cavity and let it guide you to safe shores where I hope to be waiting. How I long to stand at your side. Follow Paramel's light and wear Drury's belt. Your betrothed, Lily. 
Stenstrom put the note back down on the missive's panel. And that is all, he said. Aram stood there, contemplating what was said. Beware Drury's belt? I, I, I don't understand. It's just a cloud of gas. I've heard of old pirate stories and rumors of raider activity and the like near the belt, but in our modern league, the fleet ensures safe passage for all. There, there are no more pirates or raiders. We're in the heart of the league, after all. Yeah, well, that's not what we say on Baz, Tara said, picking up her note. Old timers used to call the route to Cana the nightmare way. Lots of nasty dreams and a whole lot of bad out there. But the fleet, the marines, what about them? How can you stop a bad dream? Stenstrom sighed. What does your note say, Tara? And with that, we conclude part one, chapter three. Three letters. And I apologize, my dogs have invaded my office and are won't stop making noise they've been sleeping for hours but of course as soon as i come here and turn the mic on it's yippy yippy growly growly fighty fighty are you guys done boston terriers best dogs in the world in any event they uh, determine well if tara gets the missive panel working pretty well and is able to access the ship's archives and she sees that lily was there amongst the crew in the final days of the of the previous crew before the ship was vacated and scuttled and they see lily standing amongst all the people departing and eventually she's there by herself and she pulls a letter out of her handbag and leaves it there and if you recall from many readings ago when they first arrived on the seeker they found a weird letter list sitting there in the center of the corridor and when they look at it they it, it seems to be addressed to them whoever looks at it that's what they see stenstrom sees that it is of the arcane and that so there's something weird about it they decide let's just open it get it over with face whatever is in there and, and be done with it Inside are three letters, one addressed to each of them. And Stenstrom's letter is from Lily, and she tells, she confirms what he saw previously that she is of the uh, something of the arcane, and that she's had to lie, and that she's been protecting him throughout his life. And we saw several instances where Lily did, in fact, protect Stenstrom at key moments. If you look back, think back to the sands of the solar empire and the se second part of the book there are moments when he needed help and help came to him not in an obvious way but in a indirect way and that that was lily protecting him and she says the way ahead is dangerous and that they need to beware of the leeward side of drury's belt leeward be you know these are all nautical seafaring terms but with the solar winds, you can have a, a leeward and a windward side of things, I, I guess. Don't think about it too much, please. You know, this isn't a, this is a swashbuckler in space, not a primer on space travel. Just, just go with it. it says, watch out for the leeward, leeward side of Drury's belt, and I've plotted a safe course for you. And when you're ready, stick this envelope inside Paramel's cavity, the lantern's cavity, and it'll illuminate a beam, and you follow the beam, and you'll be safe. But first, let your two compachos, Tara and Aram, read their letters. Let's see here. The next chapter is chapter four, A Curse. So that is probably a little too long. And this will be well over an hour reading. So we'll get to The Curse next week. Until then... This is Ren Presents. I'm your host, Ren. Peace out.